verses 2 through 6. And the rest is just goodbyes. Um, 4, 7 and following. Personal notes to individuals, ministry that's happening in that. Um, there is good stuff there, but <laughs> we're just not going to go there. Uh, <clears throat> but it's an interesting way in how Paul finishes off this letter. And I think it's very fitting and how he brings us to a close. And sometimes even there's a tendency to sort of leave off chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, and add that to the goodbyes and the final instructions and who's going where and doing what. Um, but it would be unfortunate and appropriate to do that, really, because these last verses are important, and it's a good way to, to climax all of this. And I've summed up the other sections with, you know, put to death, Right? Put off, put on. Um, be submissive. So if I could do that for this one, it's just watch and pray. It's really what it is. And it's a great way to end it. And there's so many good thoughts here, so we'll dig into them. But the underlying thing is this. Be participants in the gospel ministry. It really is what it is. There's two parts to this. He's going to deal with their prayer life. In general, verse 2, specifically verse 3, and four, and then he's going to deal with their own conduct and conversation, verses five and six. And that's really it. It's pretty simplistic, but there's a lot of great stuff here. But it's interesting that this is how Paul is going to bring it to a close, because remember how he started this letter in chapter one, verse three. We give thanks to God the Father. He began this with prayer. He's going to end it with prayer. And he really will, and I'm not going to touch on every single one of the elements that he does, but if you read through these last verses in chapter 4, uh, this last major section, uh, 4, 2 through 6, you'll see that he'll pick up threads of thought through the rest of the letter and, and bring them over just by key terms. So it really is bringing all of this to a summation, a close. But it is about participating in gospel ministry. And... <clears throat> This is important because when I start looking at this and thinking about this, one of the things that we have trouble with in life is, is the distractions. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things to occupy our time with. So one of the things he's going to exhort us to do in verse 6, notice with me, let your speech always be with grace, or actually verse 5, sorry, conduct yourselves in matter, wisdom manner worthy according to those outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Literally, it's just buying up the time. We waste a lot of time in life. I mean, how many times we use things like, well, man, that just, I, you know, I lost track of the time. We lose it. Or, oh, it just slipped away from me, right? It just slips by us. And this is the point. We need to gain it, reclaim it, and use it for something useful. I remember uh, Piper came out with a book sometime back. He was going through cancer, and he wrote just thoughts about life and and ministry and all that, and it is what, I think it was like, don't waste your life. And it was actually written for older folks. So I give it to my mom, later years of her life, but it really was about that. Um, and it was about making the most of every opportunity that we have. Um, and that's why, part of the reason why I do Psalm 90 with my kids. You know, Psalm 90 is that reflecting on the eternality of God and the temporalness of man, right? You're here today, gone tomorrow. And Psalm 90 is about making the most of the time. Help me to number my days, right? So that I might offer you up a wise heart. And oftentimes we think that's just for older folks or, or adults, you know, just when you get further in life and then you, you know, help you narrow down and make sense of stuff. But it really is for the kids, right? Because your life's going to go. I mean, before you know it, you're going to be a grown-up. Before you know it, you can have grandkids. Before you know it, right? And it really is just to make the most of every opportunity. And... Part of the problem is that we just lose sight of what the main purpose in life is, right? And so Paul is going to help focus us again, but it's really just about Christ. It's always about Christ, right? For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That was his life. That should be our life. It should be that simple. Everything is about Christ. So when you're out there in the world doing what you do, why are you doing it, right? If you're just doing it to just do that thing, right, then you need to recheck why you're doing it, right? Everything has got to be about Christ. Even the seemingly most mundane things has to be about Christ. That's the motive, and that's the reason for why we do everything. So he's going to deal with the prayer life, and then he's going to deal with the practice through Christ-centered intercession interaction. 
But basically, it's partaking the gospel ministry, doing what we're supposed to be doing here. I mean, it's a great commission, right? Make disciples. That's what it's about. That's why we're here. Make disciples. So I, I can take, I can do this in my own life. I can sit there and break down everything that life is about. Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is it. If I can sum it up in one statement, that's the statement. Glorify God, enjoy Him forever. That's the one statement. I can break it down and add more to it. Then I can say that there are three ministries for the church. Worship, work, and witness. Okay? The others build in that first one, worship. So the working part and the witnessing part is all about worship. It's about glorifying God, right? Going back to that previous statement. Worship, right? Glorifying God. Working is all the one another's. Everything has to do with the Christian life. Spiritual gifts, ministry, all of that. It's about working. We're a working community worshiping God as we do that. The last one is witnessing, right? Why am I witnessing? Because I'm bringing people to God so that they can be restored to God. They can worship God, right? And glorify Him and enjoy Him forever, right? That's everything. It's everything. But the problem is we go out into our days and we forget what it's all about. We forget the main thing. And that really is it. You know, ask those who are really successful in business. They say, keep the main thing the main thing. That's it. For us as believers, it's the same thing. You should be able to break down your life like that. I can do that. In all areas of life, whether it's family, whether it's ministry, whatever everything, I have it in my mind broken down, and I'm constantly reviewing that in my mind so that I keep the main thing the main thing. Because there's so many voices coming in saying, this is, and this is the motivation, and this is your purpose, and this is your reason, this is why you got to do, and you got to rediscover, and there's all kinds of people telling you, this is why you got to do what you got to do, Right? But I just know when I get up in the morning, what I do from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. And we should all know that. And Paul knows that. And when he calls them to pray and then to practice and what they do, it's all about that. It's just about the gospel ministry. So he starts off in 4.2 and he's going he's gonna to summon them in this section. But he's going to resume a theme that he touched on in 3.17. Notice with me. And it's almost as though he, he breaks off, but it's not a parenthetical. But he breaks off from 3.17. He says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now he's going to return back to that thought again in verse 2 of chapter 4. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping in it with a, an attitude of thanksgiving. And we'll see that that is a theme that runs all the way through here. So it's kind of like he's taken that family unit, he's taken all these things, brought it in, and says, this is where you first start working it out, this is where you start putting your Christian life into practice, and it's going to go out from there. And it is nice because he does that. He starts with the household. Now in chapter 4, he's going to move to when you get out in the marketplace. You're out in the world. You're out there with everything else. You're the pedestrian life. Okay. So you start at home with your own life, with your own family, and then you move out from that. So in 3.17, he spoke of the word, deed, here in verses 5 and 6. He's going to talk about conduct and conversation. So he's going to return to these themes again. So these threads, though, I'll just tell you, run through this whole entire letter. You go back to the beginning and pick up what he's t started with, and he just runs all the way through that. And that's just the nice, nice thing about repetition. It's such a Jewish thing. You think about like in Proverbs, it's interesting with the kids going over it for so many years. We read through Proverbs and it's like all of a sudden you hear these similar Proverbs keep popping up, similar phrases keep popping up, right? With all this other stuff, there's just that constant refrains that run through there, right? Repetition is good. We find that with Paul's letter that these thoughts continue to run through the letter and he finally brings it to a close. Same thing. He doesn't leave these things behind and he just keeps picking, picking these threads up and carrying them on. So two extremes of life that are dealt with here. First is the, the hidden prayer life. And this is in chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. And then he's going to deal with the public life. But two things to keep in mind about prayer life. The indispensability of prayer. I mean, this, this is the thing that's crazy about, about Christians is we have an opportunity to commune with God in prayer, to talk to Him, to seek His guidance, right? But more importantly, to just worship Him in prayer and how seldom we do it. It's rare to see Christians pray over the meals anymore, let alone spend time in private communion with God in prayer. Right? I mean, that's, that's the craziest thing to me is that we have a chance to talk to Almighty God, Creator of the universe, right? We can commune with Him in an intimate and real way, and yet we don't do it. We don't do it. And we have to be commanded to do it, right? We have to be told, you got to pray to God, right? But that's thanks to the fall for that, because before the fall, there was no command for devotion. It was natural. There was no command to love. It was natural. There was no command to one another. It was natural. 
than the fall, and now it's got to be commanded, right? The other thing that's important to notice about this prayer is that the indispensability of praise in prayer. And this tampers it. Devote yourselves to prayer. So we need to be praying people, keeping alert in it, right? In your prayer life, keeping alert in it. But then he tempers it with an attitude of thanksgiving. This is important because it takes away fear and trembling. Okay? And we'll get into that. And then he's going to deal with then the outward busy life of the marketplace and the streets. So he deals with the intimate internal life, the hidden life, and then the outward busy marketplace life. And here's the interesting thing. It's easy to disguise a Christian life in the marketplace, the real telltale is what is your hidden private prayer life like? Do you have one? Because if it's non-existent, right, you can really start to sit and question whether you have a really solid relationship with the Lord or not, right? I mean, I ask Christians that will say, how's your walk with God? Well, I don't know. Well, sure you do. How much time do you spend in the Word, right, before His will, and how much time do you spend talking to Him? It's a good gauge, right? And if you're not doing either one of those, then I can tell you your walk with God stinks. It's just that simple. I can look back in my life, the period of walking in rebellion, three things I, I, I cease to do. Spend time in the Word of God, spend time praying, and spend time in fellowship with the brethren. You forsake those three things, and you're in trouble. You are in trouble. And you need all three of them. Not just one, all three of them. Yeah. So these things are crucial to the Christian life. So he's going to return to this. So we have the inner hidden life and then the, the public life out there. Continual prayer blended with practice, right? So the prayer life, personal devotion life, chapter 4, verses 2 and 4. Paul begins by addressing prayer in general. Then he'll move to the specific request, and he's going to ask a request in regards to himself, praying at the same time, verse 3, for us as well, that God will open up to us the door for the word. This us, he's referring to himself and Timothy and others who were present with him, right? Going back to the thanksgiving, when he says to them in chapter 1, verse 3, we give thanks. Well, who does he, he talking about? Himself and Timothy, as he mentions in the salutation. And so as they spend time in prayer together, they are praying for the church of Colossae, the church of Laodicea, the church of Herapolis. But then as they gather together, as this letter circulates, he asks for them to all pray for them, that they might have an open door for ministry specifically, and then also then they would be able to speak in the way that they ought to speak. So a couple things about prayer life. And the first is this. It needs to be persistent. There is a need for a devoted habit in prayer. And it's something, I and mean, we all, we're creatures of habit. We all have habits. And we foster habits, right? Even bad habits. It means we can foster good habits then, right? And we realize, too, that when we're commanded to do this, it's not going to come naturally. You're not going to fall into it. It's just like the things that you put off and put on. You, you know, you think sometimes, like, I'm just going to fall into the Christian life. I'm going to fall into being, a, you know, having a heart of compassion. I'm going to fall into being kind. I'm going to fall into being gentle. No, you've got to decisively determine I'm going to do this and then strive for that and make conscious decisions to be that way. You don't just fall into it, right? The Christian life is not haphazard. It just isn't. But sometimes that's kind of how we treat it. We'll like fall into these great spiritual moments and then we just don't have them. We wait for, for God to move and do something when we are supposed to be doing what? Working at our salvation, right? In fear and trembling. So when it comes to the issue of prayer life, we need to develop a habit. We need to be devoted to prayer and it's necessary. And the fact is that we need to continually occupy ourselves with prayer. And this is the first thing he exhorts on them. And then he's going to move into specifics, but this is where we need to begin. We need to be praying people. And it's interesting because Paul doesn't just say, do as I say, but not as I do. Read pretty much every single one of his letters except for Galatians, right? Every single one of them. He starts off with prayer. And it's usually thanksgiving, then requests. If you read 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, they're saturated with prayer. Ephesians, the first three chapters, is pretty much prayer. The whole entire thing, if I showed you the structure, it's just prayer. Right? We need to be praying people. So he doesn't just tell them, you need to do this, but I don't do this. No. He says, do as I do. Right? And then if you go back to the Gospels, do as our Lord did. I mean, how much time did Jesus Christ spend time in prayer? And just think about it. This is the eternal word, the eternal logos. 
If he found it necessary to commune with God the Father in prayer in his humanity, then how much more for us, right? So we need to be praying people, but we'll also see that we need to be thankful people, but this is a habit we must cultivate in our life. And this particular term that he uses here for the persistence, its most common object in New Testament is prayer. Translated to be welded to and so on, but here's the term. It's an interesting word. And the first is kataras, which has to do with being strong or steadfast. And then he has pros on the front of it and intensifies it. In other words, we have strong and steadfast. And then this, the, the word pros, the preposition, is face to face with. In other words, there is this thing that you just keep it right in front of you. Right? There's the, a persistence. You do that if you have a goal in life, like something you're striving for, you keep it right here. And in your mind's eye, it's the first thing in your mind. It's what you're always, it's like you get up, you're, ah, I'm going to do this, get up and do this. And every action is driven towards this thing, right? So that's the idea of adding this on there. So he intensifies it. So the term itself already implies steadfastness, persistence, strength, and then he adds this intensification in the front of it, which tells you how important prayer is for us, right? And how doggedly we need to go after it. So the basic meaning of this term was used to, in reference to persist, to have to be steadfast, remain with people, to be loyal to someone. It's used in marriage relationships, which is a very interesting thought if you think about it. Occupy oneself diligently with, pay person attention to. So therefore he means this. If we can sum it up, the thought of this, we need to attend constantly to prayer. We need to continue steadfastly in prayer. We need to persist in prayer. We need to occupy ourselves diligently with prayer. So then here's the question, how's your prayer life? <laughs> right, how's your prayer life? There's things that we've sort of let go of with the church. I was talking about that the other day with the Puritans. There's some great things about the Puritans. One was their, their focus on the holiness of God. That's something the church is lacking. And I'm not saying going back and buy up all the Puritan paperbacks and start reading about Puritans, but then at the same time, that wouldn't be such a bad idea, <laughs> right? Because there was a, a self-righteousness that developed in that mentality. But at the same time, the zeal and the original intent, really good. Really good. The other thing was prayer closets. They designated a place and a space where they spent time quietly with God. And they designated certain times out of the day that that's what they did. I remember reading one testimony, Puritan, and it was sharing about his prayer life. And it was interesting because as he was talking about it, he, he had this room designated, a little closet set aside. That's where he prayed. There's a little window that opened up out on, and, and it was like a basement kind of. So when it opened up, it was right to the street level. And that's where he would go and he'd pray, and he would open the window to let some fresh air in. But there was no nothing to distract, no window to look outside, but just for ventilation, he kept this window open and prayed. One day, someone showed up at the front door, knocked on the door, and it was a woman. And he was sort of taken back a bit, but this woman says, you know, I just wanted to come and to let you know the impact that your life had on mine. But he didn't know this one at all. Well, it turned out that she was a prostitute and she would stand on the corner right there near his house. And every day around the same time, she would stand there. The same time, he would have his prayer. And one day, she's standing out there and she hears this voice talking. And so she moves a little bit closer and realizes it's coming from this little window. And as she sat and listened, she would listen to this man's prayers. And as a result of his prayer, she came to Christ. These are good things. The impact of prayer isn't just merely what we think about just God meeting our needs. It's a communion with God, but who knows how God will use that time of devotion and communion with Him, right? Right? So that's significant that we should be people of prayer. It's important for us. The other is vigilance. So we need to be persistent about it, devoted to it, make it a habit, a serious habit. But he says in this, he says, you need to devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thankfulness. There needs to be vigilance. This term, keeping awake or to be alert, was drawn from the imagery of, of guard duty. And if you have anything, know anything about guard duty you know that there is an attentiveness. So one of the funnest jobs I think I had was when I worked security for Universal Studios. One, because I met all kinds of people. I got to guard Arnold Schwarzenegger, Michael Jackson, you name it. I just all, and I worked on all these different TV sets and movie sets and all this stuff. 
But the thing about the job was you always had to pay attention. When I worked graveyard shift, that was tough. But you're always looking for something to happen. You're watching, you're waiting, you're anticipating. In your mind, you're ready for if something happens, this is how I must respond to it. This is what he wants for us in our prayer life, to keep vigilant. So we need to be mentally and spiritually alert as we pray. The exhortation to vigilance presupposes that Christians are always in danger of reducing their commitment to Christ and of allowing themselves to be seized by things of lesser value. Pray with purpose. Pray with purpose. If there's anything, and I'm not going to suggest people go listen to 40 Days of Purpose and all that, but if there's anything that should be walked away from that simple fact is, is that we should be driven by purpose. But then go to the Scripture and find out what the purpose is, right? And when we pray, pray with purpose. Pray attentive, pray alert, pray awake, pray aware of what's going on around you. Pray attentively. The problem is that oftentimes if we do fall into prayer life, right, we just sort of kind of go in there lazy and sullen and just whatever. No, right? Be attentive. And this attentiveness isn't just merely about being awake and, and you know, so drink a couple cups of coffee and then pray. We're not talking about that. We're talking about alertness about what's going on in life because in this context, he's talking about what's happening in the world, Right? He's talking about our impact. He's going to move to talking about how we impact the world. As we pray for him and open doors for him and his presentation of the gospel, he's looking to the world, to evangelizing the world. Same when he goes into 5 and 6. So it's thinking out beyond that. It's knowing what's going on around us. So there is a need to be watchful and active prayer, and we need to be wide awake in it. In other words, we need to be aware of what's happening in our families. God know how to pray for our families, Right? Go back to chapter 3 as he takes all those principles and brings it in the household. We start working out a Christian life in the household, right? We need to be aware of what's going on in our homes. We need to be aware of what's happening in God's family. All right? Be attentive to what's happening in God's family. And not just talking about the local body, talking about the global. Because remember, this letter was a circular letter. It was meant to be passed around to the other churches. He tells them later in chapter 4 that I want you to read the letter that I sent to Laodicea, and they're going to read your letter. These letters were to circulate around, and they were to read them. In other words, as Christians, if we're going to be impactful in the world, we can't be like, you know, burying our head in the sand and <laughs> not know what's going on. And I'll say, just pick your sources carefully as to your awareness to what's going on in the world, right? Because there's a whole bunch of different voices for that as well. You can't depend on, you know, secular media to tell us what's going on in the world as far as believers because they won't acknowledge the fact that there is Christian genocide going on around the world. Won't say it, but it's happening, right? Children are being beheaded and set on fire. Secular news won't tell us that. They won't tell us who it is. So we need to be aware of what's going on in the world because we understand that we have a family that's bigger than us. Chapter 2, Paul says, Even though you haven't even seen my face personally, I'm going through this suffering on your behalf. And that goes back to his prayer life. We give thanks to God for you, right? Chapter 1, verse 9, For this reason, since the day we have heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. How many times do we hear things about what's going on around the world and we spend time praying for those believers? whether it's through missionaries or whatever it is, right? We need to be in tune to what's going on in the world. If we're going to be impactful, we need to be praying for those around the world, not just for ourselves. But usually our prayer life is what? It's usually needs-driven rather than God-driven, and it's usually our needs. And it's usually asking God what, what we want for this life. How can you serve me in this life? What can you give me for this life? Rarely is it asking for open doors and opportunities to serve, which we'll get to that in a second. Most of the time it's asking God, give, 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 rather than what can I give? Provide me opportunities to give for you, right? We'll look for what we can get out of that. And then extend it to other people. Be aware of what's happening in the community. And we need to be aware of what's happening in the world at large. The other is we need to, to be, not to be careless and mechanical or dull. When we pray, be attentive to what's going on. We need to be alert of the blessings received and the dangers confronting. Right? And the aspect of blessings, keeping alert in the attitude of 
thanksgiving. Right? Thankfulness is our next one. Here Paul provides an important balance to the call of watchfulness. They keep alert, but not in a spirit of fear and anxiety, right? And as we look on what's going on in the world, we see the travesties, we see all that's going on. But at the same time, we realize that God is at work, God is in control, God is doing, right? And so therefore, it keeps us from going down into this, this, this sense of you know, dismal despair and what have you. There is confidence. There is assurance, right? And there's always something to thank God for. I mean, when you look at people being driven out of their homes in different parts of the world now, Christians being driven out of their area because the Muslims are coming and taking over and putting them to death, as they're being driven out, but the gospel is spreading. So even in that, there's something to thank God for, yes? And we need to keep finding those things and assure ourselves that, that God is at work. And therefore, then, that Christ and the one of our resources is equal uh, even more than equal to the potential challenges that we face. So we need to be grateful in all circumstances, and we need to be thanksgiving. And this is a theme that runs all the way through this letter. We saw this back in chapter 1, verse 3, verse 12, and on to this letter over and over. We need to be thankful people. And this will shape us. If this is at the beginning of our prayer life of just thanking God, it will change our requests. Because oftentimes I think when we ask God for things, even spiritual things, that, you know, I need this spiritual provision, Lord. If you read back in Scripture, you, most of the time you'll find that we already have that available to us. It's the matter of our appropriating, you know. It's like asking for more power. Well, we're already told that the power is available. You see what I'm saying? So we pray for things. Oftentimes we already have that. So if we spend time just thanking God, acknowledging the things that we already have, we, all of a sudden we realize that our requests or petitions then might change and shape then what we ask God for. So this reference to in thanksgiving, then we need to let the spirit and action of gratitude surround our watching and praying lives. Always be thankful. And then finally, intercession. <clears throat> we need to ask, and we know this. But notice where he finally gets to that. Three and four, he gets to specifics, right? Go back to his prayer in chapter 1. He starts off with thanksgiving, finally he gets to verse 9, then he gets to specific requests. But even at the specific requests, it has everything to do with God. It's interesting. Notice him in chapter 1 in his prayer request for them. Verse 9, he says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Here's the so that, the reason for it. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. And then the following just builds into this bearing fruit in every good work, right? And increasing in the knowledge of God. The heart of it, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him in every respect. Go back to the prayer life of Paul when he gives him a specific request. His, his request is that, think about this now, his situation, and he tells us about it. Verse 3, for which I have been what? Imprisoned. Does he ask them to pray that he be released? No. Does he ask for his circumstances to change? No. What does he ask for? An open door to share the gospel. That's it. Right? It change. I mean, you think about our prayer life and think about the things that we pray for. Is God at the center of them? Or are we at the center of them? Are they needs-driven or are they God-driven? There's a big difference. Big difference. But we need to be able to know that we can ask God. And he asks, gives this statement. He says, praying at the same time, right? So add this to your list. Praying at the same time as well for us, that God may open up the door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. So two that phrases that happen here, right? Notice verse 3 and then verse 4. First one in verse 3, praying at the same time that, God will open a door, and then verse 4, that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. So both of those are a part of the request. So two purpose statements as far as his request. What does he ask for them? The first is this, unique opportunities to proclaim Christ. So, I 
I like the terminology here that Paul uses, and I, and I like to think of it this way in regards to just all of life. When God is sovereign, God is opening and closing doors. This is how he guides us, how he directs us, how he does this, right? But here's what's interesting to me. So the term door here, Thuron, it's an opportunity to enter a means of approach or access, right? So this is what he's looking at. This is God opening up a door, an opportunity to enter into something, a situation, a relationship, right? An opportunity, so on. So this is what we look for in life. We find this often in Paul's ministry. He's looking for these open doors, right? Open up to ministry, open up to opportunity to share the gospel, all that. But I started thinking about this. This is so intentional about the gospel. So intentional. We all know that God is sovereign. We all know that he guides and directs. He opens doors, he closes doors, and all of that stuff, right? But how often do we pray that? And especially as far as evangelism, how often do we pray for open doors? Or maybe I can ask the question this way. How often do you walk away from a situation and go, man, that would have been a great time to share the gospel. I blew it. I should have said this. I should have said that. But here's part of the problem why we miss those opportunities, because we're not thinking about them. We're not intentionally looking for them. Paul isn't only just intentionally looking for them. He's praying for them. He's not praying for God to meet his needs. He's looking for opportunities to serve. He's asking them, pray for me for opportunities to serve God with my life. Right? I mean, just think about that. One, how often do we pray and ask God for more chances to serve? I remember a pastor at seminary, he said, he said, everybody in the body, they just want to serve. You just need to help direct them. That's not true. That's not true. It's really not true. I have found the opposite, that most people don't want to serve. It's rare if someone comes and says, man, I want to serve, what can I do? It is rare that happens. And it is really rare that we actually pray this on a daily basis. God, open doors for me to serve you. And especially with prayer life, because most of our prayer life, again, is about us. Him meeting our needs. Him serving us. How often do we pray about us serving Him? Right? Is it true? It's true, isn't it? So Paul is intentional. He's intentional on serving God. He's intentional because he's looking for those open doors. And he's intentional because he's praying for it to happen. Then when it happens, he's ready. So when he tells us in verse 5 to make the most of the opportunity. Buy up the time, redeem the time, make the most of those opposition. Don't let them slip away, but seize those moments. If we're looking for them, if we're walking into them conscious and intent and praying for it, we will see them and we will respond. If we don't, we will miss them. They'll slip away, we'll walk on the other side and go, oh man, I should have done that. And we've all had it, me and you included, right? We've all done it. Drive away from the gas pump. Man, that guy started talking to me. Man, it was an open door. I should have said something. So-and-so was bringing up something, and I was so worried about my putt, I didn't take advantage of having the conversation. Right? But if we're intent, we're looking for it, we're praying for it, then when it comes, we're ready. We're ready. So look for those open doors. Pray for those open doors. It is ultimately about the gospel. This is what Paul looked for. He wanted expanded field, not only just God opening doors into other regions and other parts of the world, but relationships in people's lives. Remember, he's in prison. He's not asking for release. So he is in prison and he's asking for more opportunity. He is handcuffed and shackled, right? He's not going anywhere. Philippians 1, what happened? The whole praetorian guard was impacted by the gospel because of Paul while he was sitting in prison. This is a man not able to go anywhere. We're free. We move around. Yes? This guy is in a situation where you think there's no way to share the gospel. There's no way to impact the life. But yet, the whole Praetorian Guard. And this is tough when you start thinking about this because you realize that in the end of this letter so much was driven inwards about the life of the body and the building up but at the end he's like but you gotta be thinking out too and that's a tough balance tough balance because you can find the life of the body 
that there's a lot of work to do and you can forget about the witness. There's so much internal turning in of ministering to people's needs and being there for them and providing for them and they'll come and they'll have their needs and say, I need this need met, I need that need met and you can find that you can just spend endless amount of time doing all of that and forget to go outward. And it's really easy to do in ministry. Really easy. So pray for those open doors. Look for those open doors. Look for the opportunity of the word. And it's interesting that he expresses it this way. He expresses it with such dynamic force, with such a personal nature about the character of the word. The word. The message. May it get out there. And then for unhindered, clear proclamation of Christ. So he prays for opportunities to serve, and then he prays for the enablement to do it. Look for chances to serve, for chances for the gospel, for chances to minister, and then for the enablement to do that. Because it's interesting, in verse 6, he's going to talk about our conversation. Notice with me. He says, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to what? Each person. Each person. Sometimes when we look about impacting the world, we, we learn systems and, and do things by rote, and we have this sort of, you know, this stereo typical, right? This sort of confined speech. But then you go out there and you use the same device on every single person, right? It's just cookie cutter ministry. When you look at Christ, everything was tailor-made. He dealt with Nicodemus as Nicodemus needed to be dealt with. He dealt with the woman at the well the way the woman at the well needed to be dealt with, right? It's tailor-made, not cookie cutter. And the problem too is that when we sort of have these systems down, then when we go into conversations, we're locked into that. Sometimes we miss the conversation that God wants us to have. All right? And the realization that if God is the one who opened the door, right, and if it's someone he brings into our life, he's on the other side, been working already, long before they even got brought into our life. We have no idea what God's been doing in our life up until then. We just trust He's been doing something. Then He brings them, then He brings you, and then you have this conversation, right? He gives you the words to speak. He's working over there. They receive it. Bam, His work is done, right? I planted a pulse water, but God, He did the work, right? But if we go into things and we have this conversation already worked out in our head and we're going to walk into it and we've got to fit everything into this sort of paradigm of how we're going to have every conversation, we can miss the moment. The moment that God designed, the conversation that God wants us to have and have somebody else's. And who knows what's going to spark the conversation. It could be puppies. It could be Hebrew. It could be anything. Right? Let's just be ready. So look for these unique opportunities and then unhindered clear proclamation of Christ, verse 4, that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. The way that is right in which that I should speak it. And Paul desires to speak in a way that would be right for the need of that particular moment. Right? Because you think about the different guards that he was handcuffed to and shackled with. I mean, 24-7, there was a guard shackled to Paul. He wasn't going anywhere, right? Each of them comes with all of their life family struggles, right? Life struggles, all of the stuff that they got going on. And Paul's going to speak to each one of them, right? According to the need of the moment of that person as God wants him to. But if we're not walking into those situations intent on, yielded to, right? Looking for, then we won't have the conversation God wants us to have. We'll have the one that we want to manufacture. And I'll just tell you, you just have these conversations, not places where you'd think to have them. At times you'd think to have them. I mean, there's conversations I've had with people about the Lord. I would just never pick that moment to have it. Right? But that's when He wants you to have it, because that's how He designed it to be. And it's then that their hearts are going to be ready. For whatever reason, I don't know, but that's when they're going to be ready. Just have it. The other thing is awesome then, when you realize that if he opened the door and you, you walk through that, he's going to help you do it. He's going to enable you. 
God never, one of the encouragement truths about 2 Timothy chapter 1, God never gives us ministry to do without enabling us to do it, without giving us the spirit and all that we need to do that, whether it's spiritual gift or otherwise. He never calls us into something without giving us what we need. The Christian life, right? He calls us into a relationship with Him, but He, he avails us of everything there. It's not like I call you into a relationship with you. Okay, now, it's, you're on your own. Figure it out, right? This deistic view. Wind up the world and step out and just let it wind down, right? No, it's not how it works with God. So in practice, personal life, conduct, how we live. We need to be tactful. <clears throat> Verse 5, conduct yourselves. And in this, talking about our regular behavior, peripatete. So he picks up the word walk, as he's already talked about through this letter. He's going to finally come again to our walk out there in the world. Walk with wisdom toward outsiders. We need to be tactful in the way that we live our life. The need to be cautious and tactful so that we do not avoid needlessly antagonizing or alienating our pagan neighbors. It is one thing to know who our neighbors are as non-believers and what their background is and how God diagnoses them and all of that stuff. But at the same time then, remember though, they are unbelievers and they need Christ. Right? So we don't want to close the door on the opportunities. In a positive sense, they needed to conduct themselves in such a way that their lives will attract, impress, convict non-Christians and give the pagan community a clear impression of the work of the gospel. All right, think about in, in Titus chapter 2 when he talks about the slaves, they are to adorn the gospel with their behavior. And I constantly think about it. But that's what it is. Is that we don't just speak the gospel, we live the gospel. They should see it by how we behave, right? how we conduct ourselves, how we live our life. And then, then some will say, well, I'm not going to, you know, share the gospel. You ain't, you're supposed to vocalize it as well, right? If they don't hear it, how are they going to believe? But you live it, right? Peter's exhortation to the wife, right? And the husband who is in rebellious to the word. She might win him over without a what? Without a word. Conduct speaks volumes. What we do speaks volumes. That's why Titus... You get Titus, everywhere, good deeds, good deeds, good deeds, good deeds, permeates the letter, right? What we do matters. We need to be resourceful in using opportunities. We need to snatch up the opportunities. Again, it would translate, redeem, buy up, make the most of. Time slips. We lose track of it. We have pressure, a little of it. I mean, it's just, you, you look at with the kids, man. I, I just like constantly, like, reminded Rory and Aiden. You know, I sit there when they're sleeping at night, I just look at them. I remember when they're just like, I could hold each of them in a hand, right? Now look at them. Walking around, half the conversation, like, Aiden's like, you know, seven going on 16, and <laughs> you know what I mean? And Rory, his expressions and the things that he said, just like, dude, where do you get that? You know what I mean? They're just changing, and they're growing so fast. I mean, before you know it, I'm going to be in a walker and then a wheelchair. Then my kids will be changing my diaper. It's going to happen fast. You think about how we use our time. I don't want to be at the end of my life and look back, man, I wasted so much time. I had so many opportunities and I wasted them. I wasted them. And that really was Piper's gist of his book, was that you go later in life and you're going to spend your last years, you know, walking around the beaches, he says, picking up shells and so on like that, and just spending, that's how you're going to spend your time in the end. He says, well, what a waste. What a waste. I want to be like Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he looks back. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. I'm good to go home. I'm good to go home. I don't want to look back and find regrets. I should have. I could have. I didn't. Right? I want to look back and say, I did. I did. And so in Colossians and Ephesians, both of them, with such a, a universal cosmic scope, both of them come with the same exhortation, buy up the time. Buy up the time. Make the most of every opportunity. There's just so many distractions. I mean, this is the one nice thing. When I know what I got to do, I, right? It, it narrows my decisions in what I do in life. If I know as a believer this is my ultimate task, right? And this, in regards to my own spiritual gift, how, what I'm supposed to do as far as God has designed me to do, that is so nice 
because it helps you remove the things that are unnecessary in life, to get rid of that excess baggage that you don't need. That's why I, my kids I say it's, it's a great day when you can understand how God has shaped you in the womb, the abilities and the talents He's given you, and then as you come to Christ, the spiritual gift that He's given you, because now you see how God has defined you to be, what He wants you to do specifically and uniquely in this broad scope of what you need to do as a believer. When you discover that and understand that, that is so freeing throughout the rest of your life, because you're not walking around going, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? At college ministry, all these guys, older, they're walking around, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, jumping from occupation. They just go, but you know, right? Whatever else changes in your life, you know that one constant. I'm a Christian and I make disciples wherever I go, right? So then all of those other things that change, because that will come, you'll go from here to here to here to here, and those things will change, but you know that constant. And then when things come and you go, well, does that interfere with me being Christian and sharing the gospel and leading people to Christ? Yes, then I don't do that, right? Decision making made easy, right? But when we lose sight of who we are, what we're here for, what we're supposed to be doing, decision making becomes complicated. Becomes complicated. It's not God's problem. And it isn't that he hasn't told us. It's our problem. It's we fail to know and we fail to keep that in the forefront of our minds. This is what I'm about. The Great Commission. My dad will go out on the golf course. He knows what he's there for. Mandate, right? The guy will say, well, you're trying to lead us to Christ. Well, exactly. That's what I'm commanded to do, right? Wherever I am, that's what I do. It's the awesome thing about it, right? And it gives meaning and purpose to what we do, right? I'm not just shopping to shop. We meet, meet someone in the grocery store, meet one of your neighbors, and then all of a sudden, God opens up the door. Do you cultivate a relationship? They want to go have coffee. You want to talk, and they need counsel and guidance. That's awesome, right? All of a sudden, going to the store has become something supernatural, you see what I'm saying? But if we just go and it's just going to the store and that's all we're there for, right? You might miss out on, you might miss out on key relationships that God wants you to have with people. Buy up those moments. Be tactful, be resourceful, using every opportunity. Snitch, snatch up every opportunity that you can. Conversation, it needs to be invariably winsome and seasoned in grace. Your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. <laughs> I, was just, I was thinking about that, seasoned with salt, man. Does your conversation have flavor? <laughs> so they got like Proverbs, man. Proverbs, well, it's actually, it's not good for a, a, someone who is more introvert like myself, but it is good. Proverbs is always warning us about conversation. There is right conversation. There is wrong conversation. There is too much conversation. <laughs> and there's people who talk way too much. Right? It's precise. Speech is precise. Should be precise. For the need of the moment. Right? Interesting description. First, Paul says that our speech is being grace. It can be used in the full sense of God's grace, or it may be used in a generic sense of charming, meaning graciousness. This use of the word may have reflect an idiom that the readers could have understood as charming, but we can put it this way. The result is something like this. Let your speech be always with graciousness appropriate to Christians, i.e. those who live in the state of grace. In other words, when we're out there in the world, speak as though we've been saved. <laughs> right? Not like the world. And like we need to be saved along with everybody else, right? That's the tendency on the other side of salvation, right? We forget that we were once like they and needed that. The second characteristic of speech is seasoned with salt. And finally, it needs to be tailored to each individual. We need to be focusing on the time, opportune in regards to time, appropriate in regards to the individual. Right? Looking to those moments, seizing those moments, but then having the right conversation. Everyone is to be treated as an end in himself or herself and not treated as stock harangue, as the saying goes. Right? It's a tough thing to do in our culture, too, because you're in a hurry. You're on the fly. Right? Just go, 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 do, do, do. 
it's rare that like, when someone stops, like you go to the store here. When we first moved here, I thought it was so like, this is really weird. So you go to the store, walking out, and then they, you know, nice to see you, Mr. McDougal, come again, right? I, you know who I am, right? Well, of course, they looked at my card and they saw my name on it. You know what I mean? But we're always just, you know, so quick. We don't stop to just even call someone by name, you know, or have that conversation. Or if we look at life, look at our life as we walk out that door, anticipating, intent on, looking for those moments, those opportune moments, and then the conversations that God wants us to have with those people. Be ready to say the things He wants us to say. Right? And I always say that when people have you know, something they have to address with somebody else and they say, well, how, how should I you know, address this because there's this issue and I have to go talk to so-and-so about it. What do I do? I said, pray about it. Pray and ask God to provide an opportunity because then when He opens the door and provides that opportunity, He will also give you the words to say and He will prepare their heart. When you come together, it will be effective and it will be as exactly what God wants it to be. We should approach every day that way. Pray for that. Yeah. Pray for those open doors. Pray for those opportune times. And then pray for the exact words to say to that person that they need to hear from God to us. Yeah. Questions? That's all I got for you.